American University in Bulgaria. Now it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce one of my speakers, um, Martin Milev. Um, he's actually a average alumni from the class of 2009, and he has been working with me um, over the last three years as a guest speaker and also as a supporter of UPG activities, including my classes. So I'm greatly appreciate his coming again to talk about a um, topic that is uh, quite related to our class and what we do in this uh, company of our share class. And so the topic of presentation is really quite interesting, the private equity deal structures. So I hope you can enjoy uh, the next one and 15 minutes with my guest speaker. Thank you very much to be here. I know how busy time is that, okay? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so as Professor Matev said, uh, my name is Martin. I'm an AOBG alumni. And um, I've been working with this private equity company for the last three years. And uh, it's great to be back uh, again. I guess I did a good job last year, of, uh, like keeping, keeping everybody awake. So, um, so and thank, thank you again for coming. So what, uh, what will, I'll be talking today uh, is uh, deal structures in private equity. And there are three main topics that I will cover. Why uh, deal structures are important for the private equi equity investment class. Um, what are some of the common private equity deal structures that are out there? Of course, we won't be able to cover everything. And the last one is uh, what are the private, uh, what are the new structures that we actually see in Central Eastern Europe? Because Central Eastern Europe is a little bit of special place in terms of, of any type of investment. Okay, now, do you know, and by the way, I wanna make it like a conversation because I'm kind of tired of talking to myself all day, okay? So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to jump in. Uh, I won't penalize or something or anything like that. Okay. So do you know what private equity is? Okay. So this came too, too fast? No, they don't. I mean, my class is Come on, somebody. somebody. I know that it was a, a alumni challenge weekend, <laughs> and you must be tired, but let, let's, let's give it a try. Okay, well, private equity is basically holding ownership interest in a non-publicly traded private company. And uh, it is usually associated with uh, having um, control over your investment, much higher, uh, much better and higher control over your investment. Now, uh, and do you know how private equity, so now you know what private equity is. So do you know how private equity is different from the other investment classes that are out there, like stocks, bonds, commodities, futures, forwards, etc. Okay, this is, okay, good. This is number one. Well, this is not usually the case. Uh, this is usually the case, but not in the recent years, and it all depends. Less regulation. Okay, so yes, good. Different tax uh, rate. Different? Different tax rate. Tax rate? Is it? Well, it depends on the legal structure, whether your fund is on the Caymans or in Luxembourg. So it, it all depends. Okay, good. So let's try to answer this question together, okay? And in order to, to see what, what the, different, the main differences are, and uh, to highlight one of them, which is important for our topic today, let's, let's see what, the invest, what an investment process is, okay? So there are a couple of steps, um, and basically the goal of investing, the goal of professional investing is to generate return at a given level of risk, right? If you don't agree, <laughs> good, just let me know. Okay, so, and how, how do you do that? What, what is the process? I think there are basically four main steps probably, and you, of course you can break it down even more, but basically first is identifying an opportunity, an investment opportunity, whether it's, a, it's stock, bond, private equity investment, commodities, anything. You, an, uh, you identify an opportunity that is going to meet your goal and uh, that is going to meet your return and risk goals, okay? So the next step is actually entering into a transaction to utilize that opportunity. So this is the entry point. Now you, then you have holding period, then you have exit. So this is a typical life, lifespan of, a, of any investment, basically. It may vary like uh, in terms of liquidity, in terms of um, how long you hold that, 
real estates tend to be longer, like futures tend to be shorter, any type of, type of derivative is usually much shorter. Now, and what I, what I would claim here today is that private equity is different uh, from the other investment classes is that you have control over, over, this, this, the, over, the, over the last three, three stages, over the entry, holding period, and exit. Now, and this is, this is one of the differences. Of course, there's, as I said, liquidity, high risk, um, so any, any type of difference, but we are going to focus on this today. And why, why is it important that you have control? And of course, this control comes with higher risk and higher return. Um, so it is important, and it is, it is a main differentiator between private equity and other investment classes. For instance, if you think, if you think stocks, okay? You have your goal, I'm going to achieve like 10% this year, so you'll go out there, identify the stocks that you think are going to achieve 10% a year, you invest and that's it. You, make, you, you pick up the, the phone, tell your broker that, okay, I want IBM for next year, and that's it. And then you pick up the phone again at exit, and you say, okay, sell that stock and uh, send me the returns. That's it, you don't have any control over there. Now, and here comes the, uh, the difference. In private equity, you have control at exit, holding period, and, uh, um, and entry, okay? And, and what, what this control means? Now, in most of the investments, and most of the leads that we see, both globally and here, in my, for instance, in my company, most of those leads are not meeting our, our goals in terms of return and risk. Most of them don't. The trick is that you have, the, you have at your disposal a number of levers you can use uh, during, during entry, um, holding period and exit, that can adjust the profile of, of that lead, of that opportunity, so it actually meets your risk return objectives. Okay? So, and this, this is, these actions, these levers, all of them, or let's say most of them, belong to the deal structuring. That is why deal structuring is crucial for private equity. And deal the deal structures are usually set before entry, okay? And it, they're usually based on negotiations with the selling party and the buying party when you're at exit. So they're very unstructured. There's very little regulation. So if you, if you are a stock investor, uh, you cannot go to the seller and say, okay, this doesn't work for me, so uh, let's twist this and that in order to meet my objectives, okay? You cannot do that unless you are Warren Buffett and manage Berkshire Hathaway. So, so this, this is the main difference. That's why private equity, that's why in private equity deal structures are crucial and that's why actually I'm quite excited about private equity, okay? Now, um, let's, let's talk about what are, what are some of the uh, deal structures and um, features of the deal structures that are, that are out there and that can actually lead to, to uh, having an opportunity that is going to meet your goal. And um, shall we use this one here? Okay, good. So let's, let's see three, three of the four stages. So this would be entry. By the way, uh, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation on purpose because I know it makes students sleepy, especially, as I said, especially after a alumni challenge weekend. But I have my cheat sheet. All right, now, can you tell me, do you, do you know any deal structures? Any types of deal structures? Anything? Acquisition, merger. Okay, acquisition is basically a transaction process when you when you enter into a deal with the selling party and you are the buyer. So this, this process is called acquisition. Merger is when you merge the two companies. But what about the details? How do you do acquisition, for instance? You start with the due diligence. Okay. So this, this, is, this is, again, part of the process. But what is it in the details? Like the devil is in the details. What is it that you actually do? Okay, this is, this is important, and uh, yeah, this is quite important. But again, this is not something that you do at, at, at the transaction closing. What is it that you do when you close a transaction? 
Yeah, so yeah, this, this is a goal rather than a goal. Okay, and yeah, actually a step back. I will let you think about that. We'll come back to that. But basically the goal of any deal is to first to have a transaction and to have a transaction that actually aligns the, uh, the objectives of both the seller and the buyer. And this is, this is not usually easy, okay? Because like there are a number of points where there are conflicts, like who is going to control the company after the transaction, and this kind of stuff. And what do you think is the main, is the largest uh, points of point of conflict that leads to deal breaking? Well, okay, the largest the price. Not overlapping in the price of the value. Okay, so this would be the valuation. Okay, so, and what was this course quote again? Okay, good. <laughs> so, valuation, yes. This is usually when the two minds don't meet, okay? And I will give you specific examples in, in my last part about my experience when people just don't know what the value of their business is and they think that it's too much. So, yes, basically, the goal of the deal structure is to, is to come up with a, uh, with a mechanism which is going to align the objectives of both the seller and the buyer. And uh, one of one point of conflict that is usually like deal breaker is valuation. So what you do, what you do at, at, uh, at deal closing. Any better ideas? Okay, what is, what is the transaction? What does the transaction looks like? When you buy a company, what do you buy? How do you get into, into becoming an owner of that company? Okay, it could, be, it could be buyout, okay? You buy existing shares of that company. So this is, so this is my, my little map here. I'm going to be attributing the different features of the structures that I'll be talking about on, that, on this map here, okay? So we have buyout. I think this is very straightforward. Buyout, basically you go out there and you say, okay, I wanna buy your company, I buy the existing shares. Okay, any alternatives that you might think of? Ownership exchange, for example, you give a stake in your company and you get uh, some ownership in the company which you acquired. Okay, this, this would be a merger. Yeah. Okay, it's valid. What about capital raise? Have you heard of that? What do you do? What do venture capital venture capital funds do? Yes. How does the transaction look like? You get money for shares. Exactly. So actually you can put additional capital. Let's say your company costs 100 units. Okay? There are 100 shares. Now, you can either buy existing shares, so you can buy 20 out of the 100 shares at the market price that you agree, or you can, you can put additional 100 units, and then you are, you are going to own like 50% of that company, and the seller is going to own the, the, other, uh, the other 50% with his initial 100 units. So this is, this is, this is what capital raise is, and this is what growth, uh, growth and venture capital funds uh, private equity funds usually do. They go into the company, put additional money into the business, and expand the business. Okay, this is uh, yeah, this is the wisdom of behind the venture capital funds. This capital raising. Okay, what else? What else can you think of? So this is straightforward, right? What else is being what else is being traded at uh, at deal closing? Besides financial uh, financial um, assets, what else? Management rights, yes, management rights. So this is something else that that you can control. That you can control during during your negotiation. Okay, you say that uh, okay, my company, your company costs uh, two million, but this is only 
if I come in and I become the CEO and I control all the assets of the company, you might say, okay, no. But if you, if you give me three million, that is going to be the case. So this is another lever that, that you can use. This is another, uh, another feature of the, of the private equity uh, deal structures. And this is the one that is based on negotiation, of course. Okay, shall we move to another, to another section just to uh, keep you interested? Okay, now let's, let's think about, um, actually let me give you an example, okay? We were dealing with this entrepreneur um, which controls a company. He says my company costs uh, four million and we say, okay, listen, the, the market valuation of your company is around 1.5 million. And he says no. And we say, okay, why not? What is the extra value where do you see extra value in your company rather than the one that we have evaluated on your existing uh, business, on your EBITDA last year? Where's the existing value? And he says, okay, listen, um, I have uh, put the grounds for development of a new product which hasn't yet generated revenue and this has, hasn't yet generated EBITDA. So wh what do you think, is, is there a mechanism you think about like bridging, that, bridging this huge gap between the two valuation expectations. Well, of course there is otherwise I wouldn't be here. Uh, one of them is called earn out. Okay, and it could be both cash and stock. Okay, and the earnout works in the following way. Okay, your EBITDA last year was 300, and the multiple, the market multiple that, uh, that we use and that it's on the market out there is like six. So your enterprise value is like 300 times six, 1.8, right? So, and he says, no, uh, my company costs four million. And then we come, we come again to the, to the undeveloped potential of the company, et cetera. So what we do is we say, okay, good. There is a potential that is going to be, uh, that is going to be utilized um, and we are willing to pay for that, but not now. We're going to pay next year when that potential is realized, okay? So what we do, and let me use this chart here. So this, this, is, going to be, uh, this is going to be the EBITDA. We have a multiple, okay? And, okay, and this is 1.8, right? So this is a tentry. During, next year, during the holding period, that multiple, that EBITDA increases by 200, and sorry for the wrong scale, so that, that uh, the EBITDA increases by 200, okay, times six. So this is, the total is again 1.8, okay? But we have 1.2 that is being earned out during the holding period, okay? Is it clear? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And he says, okay, so you're going to give me 1.2 million more. And we say, well, of course not. Because, well, first of all, it's true that there is a potential that, is, that, that was realized in order to achieve this uh, EBITDA growth. But the thing is that we were part of that company already. So we also contributed to that with management experience, with uh, the capital that was utilized, etc. So we are basically going to split this in two. So this is going to be initial entrepreneur, and this is going to be the private equity fund. So this is this is how it works. Now and there, and of course it depends how much what is the what is the equity split. Um, and which de determines how this 1.2 extra is going, to be, is going to be separated. Now, the entrepreneur might say, okay, so you're going to give me cash then. Uh, we say, okay, it's, cash, cash is one option, but we can also give you stocks for that. 
because we want you to keep your interests into the company and, it, and so it is aligned with our interests so we can make the big bucks, bucks at exit. So we're, instead, of giving you, instead of giving you cash, the amount that, is, that, that, is, um, that goes to you is going to be uh, put into the capital structure of the company so there will be an adjustment of the equity split. So at exit, you, out of the 100 units that we sell the company for, you're going to get higher share. So this is how this is how this this stock earnout works. Okay, and he says, okay, okay, it sounds reasonable. Okay, there is a potential that is not realized. Again, I think that uh, that TB that would be delivered. So I agree to that. So th this is this is a mechanism that is bridging that could bridge uh, the valuation gap that uh, that exists before before any types of deal structuring. Okay. Um, what else? What is what what return can be generated during the holding period for the owners? Selling will be here at exit. Again, this is partial exit. Okay, what valuation models do you use for, for this course? Okay, what, um, sorry? what else? What about div dividend discount model? <laughs> okay, yes, so you can generate, uh, dividends can also bring you uh, bring you uh, positive cash flows for the from your investment okay now and this is this is my favorite one here now of course we're not going to discuss dividend because this is straightforward I mean you, what usually happens is when you when you are preparing to enter for the deal you are signing this memorandum of understanding that this is how we are going to manage the company from now on this is this is going to be the dividend distribution policy so basically you know how much dividend is going to be distributed during the holding period and under what conditions. Okay, so let's not cover that. What is, what is more interesting, I think, is dividend recapitalization. Okay, and this could be a tricky one. If you, a private equity fund can actually exit its, um, can receive exit cash flows from the business without going to exit, without selling the equity. So a trick that, that could be used here is taking on a bank loan or any type of debt facility and then distributing uh, the cash inflows from that facility uh, to the equity holders. So this is, this is what dividend recapitalization is called. Now it's tricky, you have to be in bed with the banks, your business has, uh, has to be bankable and it has to be a good year in terms of credit supply, okay? But it works. And actually, we are, right now we are considering su such, a, uh, such a feature, such a deal structure. We have a business, uh, we're looking at this business which is um, overcapitalized, meaning that its peers on the market have certain debt into the capital structure, which is, of course, cheaper and which leads to higher returns for the equity holders, okay? But th that company doesn't have that facility. So what we are planning to do is go to the bank, say, okay, we are going to cover all your covenants. You know what covenants, covenant is, right? Okay, so even, even if you give us like 2 million euros in, in working capital facility, we still will be able to cover our covenants. You'll be happy, we'll be happy. And, but we are going to distribute the cash as dividend to the owners. And this is again, this is again pre-agreed, uh, pre-agreed during the deal structuring negotiation um, before before the entry. So everything everything that that we are going to cover is either determined before the entry in the deal structuring process, or conditions for imposing additional deal structures are discussed uh, are discussed during the negotiation. So in terms of so this this is exciting like. This is, that's why deal structure is important because everything happens in the end, uh, in the beginning. 
and then it has implications all over the all over the investment period. Okay, um, another thing that is usually that that is used, um, but mainly by venture capital funds, is this preferred preferred stocks, which can be also convertible. Okay, so <clears throat> what what this means is that the venture capital goes to the um, goes to the entrepreneurs and say and says that okay, I'm going to give you the money, but I won't guarantee that I'm going to make two times my money. So the money multiple, you know of IRR, right? You know what IRR is. Okay, good. I told okay. <laughs> and then you know what money multiple is. Okay, so the, the private equity fund says, okay, I'll, gi I'll give you the money only if I can, only if you can guarantee me with certain, with uh, like defined, like, or with high extent of certainty that I'm going to make two, two times my money. So what we have is preferred stock that, that is valued two times at the, at exit is valued two times the, the value they were cost uh, at entry. So the value of money is basically doubled at exit. And no common, sh no common equity holder can receive any proceeds from exit before the preferred stocks are being fully paid. Okay? So this is, this is another, this is another trick. Uh, all right. Um, again, additional capital raises are being discussed. So what it means that, let's say that we have this restaurant chain that, and we are planning for, it, currently it has like 20, 20 shops and we're planning um, our strategy at entry is envisioning 10 more shows, but actually market potential stipulates that there could be like 12 more shows, but we need extra capital. That's, that's why we need uh, additional capital raises by the private equity fund um, during the holding period, which is going to change the equity structure. Again, this is straightforward. However, what has to be defined is how the valuation of the company would be made here during the holding, when just before you are raising the capital again. Because if you value it at 100, with, if you put an extra 20, it would give you like one, uh, one sixth of equity. But if you value it at 50, and if you put extra 20, it is going to give you two seventh, right? So this is also important, and it is also usually defined before entry. Not the price, but the, price me the pricing mechanism, okay? The valuation mechanism, and this is where you guys come in with your uh, company valuation course. Okay, let's cover something at exit as well. Um, again, here, actually I like this one quite a lot. Waterfall structure. And again, I'm going to go back to my example with the guy who, who was saying that uh, his business, his business, uh, the value of his business is like four million. And we're saying, okay, listen, no, it's 1.8 million. So, but he was he's very adamant about this four million number. And when when actually I, I think I asked the question when I asked him, okay, why do you think so? And he says, well, this is just this is just my price. There is no justification uh, behind that. Okay, it is your price. So let me let me jump a little bit to the examples. So we're saying we're saying that your business costs four million, okay? So this is four mil. Okay, and we're going to buy uh, to buy out fifty percent of that business for two million, right? So this is going to be fifty percent. Okay, in his mind, his value of, the value of his business is four million. Now, however, we're going to split this into 25% and 75%. Okay, and we're going to pay you 1.5 million now, and we're going to pay you the rest of the half million at exit. So let's see how the exit looks like. Again, scaling could be different. Let's say this is X, okay? Because we don't know what the sales price would be at that point. Okay, again, up to now, the investment cash flows for the funds 
for the front is 1.5 million. Okay. Now at exit, let's say that we are going to sell the company for X units. Okay. The waterfall structure looks like this. Okay. First 500,000 are going to go to the entrepreneur because this, this, is, this is part of the purchase price. He won't guarantee, guarantee on that, okay? And we have the reminder, okay? The reminder, and let's just take a notional, notional capital here. This is going to be 12 million, okay? So we have 11.5 here. Now, how is this 11.5 split? What do you think? He would have the initial 50% that he possessed the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So this 50. Yes? Yes, this, this would be his desire. But um, <laughs> again, deal structuring is about aligning goals of both parties. So we say, no, this is, this is not going to happen because we don't know whether we are going to sell the business for 12 million because 12 million is calculated based on the EBITDA and the multiple. Multiple is something that we don't usually control at exit, but um, EBITDA, and EBITDA is basically given. We're going to take last year EBITDA. And if the potential that you are saying is going to be realized does not realize, we're not going to reach the 12 million. And our fund is not going to reach the the goal of, let's say, 25 or 30% IRR uh, that it has. So what we say is that from this amount here, we're going to take this chunk of money, okay? Which is, again, unknown. However, it can be defined, okay? So again, here, we're not at, at um, entry. We're not specifying what this amount would be here, but we're specifying the mechanism which is going to be used to calculate that amount. So what we do is basically we take our investment, 1.5 million at entry, okay? Then if, if there are any additional capital raises or dividends for that matter, <coughs> we account for them and we want to have such number here that our return is 25% IRR. Okay, is it clear? And, the rem and now we have another remainder here. And then the remainder, it is split 50-50. Okay, what this deal structure achieves is that basically, and just imagine that, um, do you have a long stick or something? Okay, no. But anyways, just imagine that, that this is the valuation here. Again, I was not the best at uh, drawing in school. But imagine that this is the valuation. Actually, <coughs> this is the valuation here, okay? So if it's, if it's lower, if it's lower, this is going to go down. So this has high, highest priority, then it's this amount with the second highest priority, and then whatever is remaining is split. Okay, so what this deal achieves is that, okay, we're saying that your, your value of the business is four million, only, only if we can achieve at exit, if we, if we have preferred uh, proceeds at exit, which is going to guarantee our return, okay? So only then we're, we're giving you the four million. And if, if we are giving you the four million, then we're going to split the company 50-50 as if, as if at the entry we were giving four million. So whatever happens, uh, you have your return guarantee. So um, then if the business happens to be better than four million, then we're going to take the losses. By chance. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say, let's say that this amount here, okay, let's say that this amount here covers only the 50,000 the 50, and our, our return. Then there is no split. Then what, is, what the case is, is that we have acquired the company which costs much, much less. So this notional, capi, this notional valuation of 4 million is gone, okay? 
he doesn't have any, any other proceeds than the 50,000. So basically what we did is acquire the company for 2 million. Basically there was no potential that was realized. So he basically guarantees with his other 50% that, uh, that there is such potential. So if there is not, there is no 50%. Okay, and actually the worst case, the worst case scenario for us as investors is if we sell the company for 500,000 or less. Then there would be this trench here, and let's call it trench one, trench two, and trench three. So there would be, uh, there would be no cash for trench two. Then we'll be, we will have paid uh, 1.5 million for nothing, okay? And this is, this is the, the high risk profile of the private equity investments. So, and by the way, this is a deal structure that we are going to propose next week. So we'll see, we'll see whether the guy is going to like it or not. Okay, any questions? I think you have a question. No? <laughs> no, actually, um, no, it's not. This is about a financial services company in the Czech Republic, um, which is dealing, basically, its existing business is money transfers. So basically, they're a franchisee of one of these um, Western Union money grant type of uh, big money transfer companies. So they're the local uh, franchisee in the Czech Republic. And uh, what it has is basically partnership with uh, um, partnership with the, this big company, money transfer company on one side, and it has distribution partnerships with uh, four or 600 uh, local partners in the small cities. Okay, it's quite interesting by the way, because like, this type of money transfers, not bank money transfers, but this kind of uh, money transfers are usually done from workers working abroad who are sending money home, and they're usually sending money home to people which are not living in the cities and don't usually like to go in the bank, okay? And this is the existing business. What we wanna do is uh, use that network of uh, 600 players, of 600, um, distribution points and push another product through, the, through that network. And this would be probably microcrediting. So what, what the entrepreneur says is that, okay, I've prepared the stove for cooking this new product, so I have the existing business processes for the microcrediting. Uh, and what you just need to do is just put some cash and uh, uh, like distribute the cash uh, to the clients. And we say, okay, well, listen, it's not that easy. And this, this, this potential hasn't yet generated revenue, so basically we don't know whether it's going to work or not, so we need some kind of guarantee. So, and this is the type of structure that, uh, that, uh, that we came up with that is going to align our goals and his goals. Okay, um, and I'll be talking about this guy a little bit more uh, in the third part, but let's just cover some other, some other deal structure features here. Um, at exit. Now, what we, what we have seen quite often is we see very entrepreneur who very much trusts in, the, in his business. He has high trust in his business and, uh, and he says, okay, um, I wanna stay for long. I wanna stay for the next 15 years in this business. And we are like a medium term investment fund. So uh, we stay up to four or five years. And he says, okay, well, then there's no deal, okay? But no, actually there is a structure that can, that can also accommodate this kind of discrepancy between the, the, the holding period aspirations of the two parties and it, uh, it is called reverse buyback. Okay, in the reverse buyback, what we agree is that okay? We're going to uh, we're going to invest in in your company, and instead of selling to a third party at the exit, <coughs> sorry, we're going to uh, sell to you. Okay, uh, this is not my favorite one. 
uh, because even though it gives you guaranteed returns, so basically you know what is going to happen, the guy tells you that we are going to value the business at uh, EV to EBITDA multiple of six, which could be which could be good or bad depending on the market conditions, but you know how much you're going to uh, value the business for, and depending on the EBITDA that is achieved, uh, you know how much is going to get, how much you're going to get. However, this, this creates different problem. Uh, basically, it is going to, um, it is not going to align the incentives of the, uh, of the fund to the incentives of the entrepreneur. Because what, what he would try to do is basically uh, hold, back, hold back the development of the company and accommodate potential that he would be able to realize after we do this reverse buyback. While what we want to do is maximize the, value of, maximize the value of the company at the point when we'll be selling back uh, equity to him. So this is, again, this is, this is an alternative. I wouldn't say it's my favorite one. Can okay. I ask you a question? Sure. What if it takes point the entrepreneur is broke and cannot buy back? Mm -hmm. What do you do then? Well, <laughs> usually you got, uh, he's going to guarantee with his equity. Okay. So what would happen is, let's say that we're going to enter 50-50. He, sa he says that he's going to buy us back, and if he doesn't, we're going to take his 50% uh, 50, um, 50, 50 stake in the equity, and then we will have the right to sell to a third party. So he'd better have money <laughs> if he wants to stay for 15 years in the business. Um, okay, and what else? I think, yeah, CPs. Condition precedence. This this is something that that is valid for entry, holding, and exit. Okay, CPs is basically we're going to do something if something else is achieved. Okay, and let me let me um, go back to this restaurant business from last year. I don't know. Is there anybody who was here last year when I? Okay, I wasn't that boring then. Oh, yes, <laughs> I knew that you were going to remember the mo <laughs> the minor things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Good. So basically, with the, with that guy, we had uh, CPs that basically you either put your all your assets on the balance sheet, or we are not going to do the deal. <laughs> okay. So this is something that you can see here. Okay. Here, and it exit. So you're, you're doing a condition precedent. Um, and let me try to think of an example. Yes, I mean, this is, this is one thing. We're going to buy your company only if something else is done, like only if the assets are, are on the balance sheet, okay? Or here, we're going to pay you the earnout only if the EBITDA is not only higher than the EBITDA that we already paid for, but if it reaches the amount of money that you said that it's going to reach. Only then you, you are going to get some money, okay? And the same at exit, okay? So this, this, is, this is fairly common, and uh, the, the lawyers are usually engaged with that, okay? Um, let me see whether I have anything else on my, on my cheat sheet. Yeah, I think, I think these are the most common ones that, uh, that we've seen, that, we've, that we have considered. Now, and let's, now let's go to the third part of our talk. Basically, what type of deals are happening and, and are being considered in our region, in Central Eastern Europe. Now, as you know, it is a special place because basically the investment culture is not as advanced as in Western Europe or, or um, in the States. And in terms of private equity, also not as advanced as um, in the Nordic countries. Like, I think Sweden is the country with the highest uh, share of uh, private equity investment store um, against GDP, okay? So they're fairly advanced, but unfortunately we are not, okay? So, and like these are, these are, these are relatively straightforward, okay? So one challenge that, we've <laughs> that we are facing is that explaining this to an entrepreneur, like the restaurant, uh, the restaurant owner, who doesn't have the assets on, uh, on his balance sheet, explain, explain him the, the preferred stock conversion policy, for instance. 
So th this could be a challenge, okay? We just don't have the investment culture yet, okay? So w one, of the major, one of the main goals uh, when we are considering to propose some deal structures here, in both in Bulgaria, in Hungary, Czech Republic, and Poland, is whether it's simple enough to be understood, okay? Whether, whether the guys will be able to understand it and whether it's executable, okay? Because you don't, you have no use of uh, having a deal structure uh, with a number of CPs, etc. if the guy says, okay, no, uh, sorry, I cannot take that. Okay, and actually I've been in a situation when I had to explain to this same guy with the restaurant business that we are going to give you this kind of type of burnout and this is going to imply valuation of seven, uh, seven times CBDA versus the six times CBDA that you want right now and versus the five times CBDA that we want to give you right now. And he said, okay, I, I don't understand. So if he doesn't understand, we don't have a deal. If we don't have a deal, we don't have return, okay? So our objective is not met. So this is, this is quite important. So let me go back to this financial services business, okay? And one, uh, and actually it is a very good example of this, this person factor that we have to account for, okay? When we first met with this guy, he, says, uh, he said that, okay, uh, and we ask, okay, what do you want? Actually, every conversation starts with that. Okay, what do you want? And he says, okay, I wanna have professional company, like in UK, um, I don't want any money now, I want everything at exit. And he said, okay, great, you're our guy, come in. Now, what he wants, like four or five months from that point, <laughs> he wants to maximize his, um, his earning here, he wants to see four million valuation, and he wants to see the cash now and guarantee it. Either now or guarantee it at exit, that, that 500,000. So, so this, is, this is an example of a typical entrepreneur who you, you will have to deal with if you do uh, private equity investments in our region, okay? And that's why we had to develop this uh, waterfall um, structure with the three trenches, etc. And actually, I'm afraid that he might not like it. He might not be able to understand that. But we'll see, we'll see. So this, this is a risk. So, and let me, let me give another example. Now, this time we have a logistics company uh, here in Bulgaria, which is being owned by a foreign strategic investor. So basically that, that investor, he has a number of uh, logistic company, <laughs> companies all over the region. And for some reason, um, it wants to dispose of the assets in Bulgaria. Now, wh what we do there is basically, we said, okay, your business, uh, the value of the business right now costs um, 2.2 million, if I'm not mistaken, okay? And they say, okay, you have to pump up that number if you, if you, wanna, if you want us to pick up the phone. So, <laughs> and th these are the, guy, the guys abroad. So these are fairly sophisticated guys who do at least one or two M&A deals a year. So what we do there is basically we're using this, um, this earnout structure that I talked about. So basically they say that, again, why w the conversation goes as follows. Why, why do you think your company costs like um, 3 million? They say, okay, because we just signed a contract with, uh, with Bila, which is going to generate that, that much revenue next year, which is going to uh, translate into that much EBITDA. That's why the business costs that much, okay. Great, that's great for the new owner, us. However, we haven't seen that contract performing. So that's why we're, we're going to propose this, uh, this earnout structure. Now, if, they, if, they meet, if, they gen if the company generates that much revenue from, a, from the new contracts, we're going to pay them the earnout. So this would be a cash out. Now, another, another issue that we might have with that company is that it might go over our um, transaction size limit, okay? And this, this could happen fairly often. often. So, <clears throat> for instance, our fund, we invest between two and five million euros into, into uh, majority stakes in, in, in companies. Uh, but sometimes the case might be that uh, we don't, we just have to pay more in order to acquire majority in that company or if you wanna acquire the whole company. So basically we wanna give them 5.5 million 
But the problem is that uh, our investors in the fund know that allow us to invest only five million. So what we are also considering in this case is something called vendor financing. Okay, so what vendor financing is, is basically uh, we are going to propose that, okay, we have this, this gap of, let's say, uh, half a million or one million euros, which un in, unless we basically reduce the size of our investment to that amount, uh, there will be no transaction. And the thing is that they want to sell the company fairly quickly, so we're kind of in a better bargaining position here. Now, wh so what we are going to propose is this vendor financing option, okay? So this means that we are going to ask the seller to lend us money at given uh, interest rate in order to finance the transaction, okay? Or what it means is that he's going to postpone the collection of the, and of the purchase price and we're going to pay 8%, let's say, interest rate on that, on that uh, part that was postponed. So this is vendor financing. This is how this is how you can breach you can breach your uh, deal deal limits uh, with the value of the company, even if you agree with the value of the company. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. But by using this vendor financing, uh -huh. don't you actually cheat your own investors who wanna diversify the risk and they don't want you to put more than five million in one deal? Mm -hmm. Uh, no, because we don't, we, don't, we don't invest more than 5 million. Yeah, but you still get to pay back the loan. This is only if the company performs. Okay, if we are able to sell the company, so what the investors are looking for is maximum risk exposure. Okay, what is the risk of them losing 5 million? Okay, or what is the risk of us losing 5 million? If, if the company does not perform, as the seller says at entry, the, he's never going to see the, this vendor financing. So there's no possibility that you lose more than five million. No. So this is the maximum exposure that you get. Okay. Now, <coughs> any questions? Yeah, well, sure. Um, in all these discussions, you mentioned that uh, you as a fund use only the multiples to have the business you want to acquire. Um, in my classes, we learn about many other you know, uh, different ways, most of them are based on DCA analysis, but obviously it's not going to be a case or use only multiple tests. Well, I would say that. Uh Usually that is the case. At least this gives you the rough idea of how much business is worth when you first see an opportunity. It's, it's very easy. It happens within two minutes. Okay, now, of course, there are drawbacks. And I, I, I would rather say that this is specific for the private equity industry. Okay, because there is, namely because there is this deal structuring option and control that you have, and mainly because you have, you can negotiate. Okay, so... What, what we do is we use this, this um, multiples as reference point. Uh, we say, okay, your business is going to cost around uh, 5 million euro based on, based on your EBITDA and on the multiple. However, the next stage is developing a very detailed financial model. Very, very detailed. Um, and we see, okay, if this multiple doesn't work for us, we're going to propose lower multiple. Okay? So this, this is where the negotiation practice comes in. And if he says, okay, I don't like this multiple, at least using the financial model, we know what tolerance we, we as investors have in order to increase that multiple so that our um, return goals are achieved. Okay? So, and of course, like, this, is, this, is, this relates mostly to uh, private company valuation. Now, what we had, actually what we have now, is a very specialized company which doesn't have many peers, and actually there are just a couple of transactions, so we have very few data points. We have one EV2 EBITDA multiple of nine, and we have one EV2, multiple, EV2 EBITDA multiple of four. So what do you do then? So what we did is we tried to find public companies, and uh, we looked into their financial reports, we took the market cap, added the, the debt, and then we saw what, what the implied EV2 EBITDA um, ratio is, and then of course 
for the public companies, you have to add a markup on that on that ratio because basically, if you're buying control, there is a premium. Okay, if there is if the the company is liquid, there is also a premium. Okay, any other questions? Sure. Do you? The company pays lawsuits. We? Not yet. <laughs> no, just kidding. No, actually, we're like very few things that there is legal risk go out of, of our boardroom discussion. Okay? And usually, there, there is a, in Central Eastern Europe, actually, this is very relevant. In Central Eastern Europe, there is usually uh, some kind of legal preference or legal tolerance of protecting the entrepreneur. Okay, um, however, we're, we as, as company are very careful, uh, we are very careful and also our, uh, our peers are very careful with that. I mean, before any proposal goes out, it, goes, it gets screened through, through our legal department and our external lawyers, so. Sure. Can you give an example if the company actually was money on investment? Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> Actually, I cannot give an example from our experience uh, because we don't have such an example, and it's good. Um, but what usually happens is it, uh, that investment is being cried off, written off, or it is being sold at significant discount. Now, with one of the companies that we're currently looking at, we're going to enter the, enter, potentially enter the company by buying the stake of another private equity fund that invested initially into the company. At least this is what we are considering. Now, this stake is discounted at 20% uh, of its face value. So it lost, if they invested 1 million, they lost 800,000. So, but again, they did quite, quite good returns on the other investments. And actually, this, this actually goes, goes to the profiling of the private equity funds. Like venture capital funds, do you know how they make their money? In terms of portfolio strategy. Okay. Yes. So basically one, one, one win makes you like 20 or 30 or 50 times your money and the other you're basically writing them off. And actually, this is this is one reason I think I personally think that it's very difficult to do private uh, to do venture capital in Bulgaria because basically you don't have you don't have stable flow of of uh, of projects which you can do ten do uh, do successfully one and then write off the other nine. So because basically when you take your pipeline, how 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 what is the percentage you think that that of the leads that we see that actually happen uh, turn into transactions. Let's say that we see 500 leads a year. How many do you think that, that actually, what percentage of those do you think that actually happen as transactions? Yeah. Two. <laughs> so you can do the math. I mean, if you want 10, 10 companies in your portfolio and if this is 2% um, of all the, all the leads that you see, so you need 500 leads a year, okay? And the problem uh, with this business in Bulgaria is that there is no entrepreneurship culture yet, as I say, that can generate 500 individual leads a year. However, I know that there are some initiatives like the Jeremy Seed Funds, etc. cetera. Uh, I think they generate like 700 projects, so this is very promising. Okay, other questions? Please use me for anything. Can you do a leverage buyout? Usually, yes. However, with our strategy, it would be difficult. Um, because, mainly because we are investing into services and, um, this, and SME services. So, for a transaction between two and five million, you can imagine that the revenue of that company is like 10 million. It's usually, it usually has very low fixed asset base and it's not bankable. And that's why the owners of those businesses are ready to see us as a partner, and have to say an expensive partner, rather than go to the bank. So, and that is why we cannot usually do this leverage buyout. 
So this is a problem that there is limited credit supply going to that particular sector. And it, yeah, it's usually typical for larger, uh, for larger companies, high fixed asset companies, um, with stable cash flows and predictable, predictable performance in the future. Like the types of the types of companies that you are going to do DCF model about, like telecoms or banks. This is when you do leverage LBOs. Okay. Anything else? Can I? Okay. Sure. Um, my previous class, I think was um, visiting my performance one class, and he was talking about you know the uh, skills, knowledge, uh, personality, and all these kind of stuff that I need for young people like you to go to job interviews and get a good job. Um, the purpose here is not uh, the same, actually, it's completely different. But my question would be, uh, how much his um, OBG education helped him to? Uh, be good in that job, or that's a plan maybe can quit the job and find another job. What do you, what do you think about well, coaching? Okay. Well, basically, uh, when I when I uh, got into this position, I was definitely not prepared. AOBG did not give me the preparation to do the job. However, it gave me the training that I used in order to develop the skills or that my uh, colleagues used in order to develop the skills that are needed. What I mean is that, let's not fool, fool ourselves. We are in, our, our in that chair like three years ago, okay? Let's not fool ourselves. We don't have the skill, the skill set to be, to be accomplished prof investment professional, okay? What we have is a potential to develop into such kind of person, okay? And I think AOBG was great for that. It basically gave you, gave you the, gave me the opportunity, like it gave me the, how, how to structure that. I know how to learn things as a result of the education here. Okay? And actually, I, I've seen this in, in a couple of other, we, I had, we had two interns last year, and I've seen that uh, they did not have the skill set that was required of course they didn't, nobody had at their first kind of professional experience, but they had the discipline and they had the training to develop certain skills. And that, that was great, it was great. So in terms of that, it is very useful, yes. Okay, anything else? How hard is to write capital engineering? Very hard. And it doesn't happen in Bulgaria. Uh huh. Well, <clears throat> let's let's structure it a little bit, okay? So the private equity fund already has committed capital, and it invests into into investee companies, okay? And this capital is being raised from from somebody else, from other investors, okay? So you're asking about this capital that is raised for the private equity fund, right? Okay, so our experience is that our investors are basically high net worth American, high net worth American individuals, and we also have some pension funds, and it was extremely difficult to raise that fund. It is 25 million fund, 25 million dollar fund, and um, we raised it, we closed the fund in the end of 2009 just after the, the turbulence of the, of the crisis. So it was, it was extremely difficult. Now, during like two years ago, we started doing um, second, second um, fundraising. Um, however, we were advised to wait until we first accomplish our first fund, okay? And it is difficult. It goes through very, very strict due diligence processes like EIF, EBRD, are typical multinationals who are investing in this type of growth funds in our region. Um, it, is, it is difficult, but it is not impossible. And if you're interested in the process, we can, do, we can talk about that as well. Okay, anything else? By the way, I'll be at your uh, presentations tonight, whoever is presenting. In this room? Yeah. yeah.
Okay. Well, you and me will be the judges. Oh, great. So, and um, I'll be around. Uh, I'll be around. So, if you think of something else, and if you if you wanna. I think they have IBM class in uh, 15 minutes or 30 minutes, and they, some of them, maybe all of them, will present both in the IBM project. So, we are welcome to okay. to be in this class great. in the next room. I have one last question. Uh, we had an M&A simulation game. We try to you know uh, do some kind of simple analysis and then to negotiate, actually you fail, okay, some, some business can conclude the deal for five seconds, okay. <laughs> um, but did they reach their goals? <laughs> yeah, 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 we, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone tried to, you know, spend half an hour to negotiate, to beat up the price, how important uh, are negotiation in your uh, private business? Well, this is, this is the, well, who is involved in that process mm -hmm. as well? Well, as I said, Actually, negotiation is like the 90% of the, of the deal structuring. And uh, as I said, deal structuring is like 90% of the success, let's say. So negotiation is quite important. And that's why, and it also, it could be challenging here with our local entrepreneurs. And um, it usually involves different, different parties, like from our, both from our side and from their side. Usually there is legal counsel. Uh, when the negotiations are at the stage where they have to be formalized, where uh, like memorandum of understanding has to be signed. Um, and of course, our partners fly from uh, Budapest for this kind of this negotiations. So it is really important. I mean, this is, actually, this is, this is the essence of the, of the, of the deal structuring, negotiations. Okay, I guess yeah. this is last question. So thank you very much for the exciting hey. uh, speech um, and for the whole interesting discussion. Even a little lot of new things like uh, waterfall structure and all the stuff, and it's a bit new for me as well. So guys, I hope you can also benefit of uh, yeah. uh, Martin experience. He graduated in 2009 with four years of experience in, in that business mostly, I guess. Yes, well, I spent three, three, six months in another company, but it was also an investment fund. So uh, you see how many different and uh, new things we can learn and uh, you may decide um, what should be your professional career. Um, so hopefully um, you know, my classes and our guest speakers can, can help you to make a choice uh, uh, where you want to you know, spend the next few years and what kind of business do you want to start and whether you want to work for a big bank or for a private equity firm or become an um, you know, entrepreneur and do your own business. Uh, so it's a, it's a difficult choice, but uh, it's a quite interesting. So thank you, Matthew, to be here today. Thank you very much. This program is brought to you by AUBG Talks. For more, please visit us at aubg.edu/talks.